uh, talk about some of the principles behind the site, spatialising information, developing partnerships with key information providers, bridging user knowledge gaps and user evaluation. So we're not talking very much about the technology, but about the project, about the people behind the project and some of the principles. Okay, so a really quick snapshot to give you an overview in a few seconds about what's on there. So overview maps across Victoria, maps that are clickable, legends are clickable to information, such as reports, associated information about mapping units, uh, information developed from projects, some of it published, some of it not published. Maps based on project site information. Uh, historic documents scanned, made available. Uh, even historic maps made available too, such as that 1944 map of the distribution of wheat in Victoria. Uh, a lot of the soil information linked to glossary of terms, so that people can understand the terminology. Uh, lots of maps where you can click on to get site information at the regional level as well, and also PDF based maps at the regional levels. And lately we're doing some uh, video work as well, where video is open up on the page, and Matthew Cox has been instrumental in that. You can talk to him downstairs if you're interested in that sort of thing. So in terms of spatialising information, this is an example to do with declared water supply catchments. So there are important catchments in terms of water supply, but there's also land use issues associated with it. So this provides, you can get into this through a map showing you the areas we can click onto and go to the relevant information. Or you can go to it via tabulated information uh, based on each of the regions and you can click on the catchment and get information. Now a lot of this information has been held by people such as David Rees who's managed to collect a lot of this over the years and maintain it. Some of it was published in very limited numbers, it's very hard to get. Uh, there's also a lot of unpublished information as well. Getting out, that out of filing cabinets, making it available as downloadable documents associated with each of those catchments. And also the original proclamation notices as well, land use determinations. All available information about each of those catchments and relevant maps. Okay, just to get an idea about who's using that information. Uh, so for example, the top quote, don't read all the writing, but I've underlined it just to uh, highlight some key points. Victorian Environmental Assessment Council, project manager there, uh, is a regular user of that information and uh, reports that the site makes available information uh, which would otherwise be substantial loss through the passage of time. So he recognises that. And also a project officer with DBI who works with land use. Determinations. I uh, was pretty impressed because she put about 14 exclamation marks there. And she noted that this is going to make processing of land use determinations for Section 90 is just so much easier. And in the past, she's had to scrounge around to find this information that's proved to be a huge challenge. So the information's in one spot, easy to access. Another example is with weeds. So there's information about over 200 noxious weeds in Victoria. And one example is a box somewhere here where there's Textual information, photographs, links to other websites, information about the potential distribution based on modelling by the weeds group within Primary Industries Research Victoria, and also information about the present distribution. And this map here has been created from data from three different databases and different historic surveys. So the information is not publicly available because there's obviously privacy issues associated with it. But if you actually get all the data out and present it visually like this, aggregated upwards and provides a nice little overview of where the weed has been recorded or, or currently exists. So it's a nice little spatial product that you can have otherwise. Uh, another example is with geological and geomorphological sites of interest. So for example, for the Port Phillip Western Port region, these are all the sites, there's lots of them. Now these are actually obtained from four publications, which you can see there. And these publications are very hard to get. They were printed in limited numbers. They weren't bound very well. They were falling apart. But by making all the information available here, where you can click on the key map sheet that you're interested in, and then it provides a more detailed map. You can then click on the sites, which are all listed on the right. And if you click on the legend, you get the associated information with that site. Now, this can all be updated at the time it was printed with black and white photographs. It can be updated with colour photographs improved information as well. So I'm making it very accessible to find this information because if people don't know it's significant anything could happen in that particular area. Now one example of recent years it was a program leader from Melbourne Water who um, was very happy with the website and found it to be a powerful summary for accessing this otherwise hard to find information. And 
bring out spatial data that is otherwise buried in reports and the like. So Melbourne Water was interested in a significant area and uh, by looking at this site they found that they could actually refer people to it and actually realise they're missing. Okay, what we want to do in the site is bridge years and knowledge gaps. And just by way of example, in the Kranger Light region with landslides, is showing an overview map of where they occur, which is these polygons here. And that's overlaid with geology, so you can get an overview of what geology is associated with. Click on and get a more detailed map in some areas. And textual information about those land slips, and also relevant reports, and even a scientific paper. So that's the idea is to give the overview and let people drill down into the more detail. Uh, the other example is with soils, and there's a lot of soil information on here. So for example, if we skip land, an overview of soda soils, which are texture contrast soils with sodic subsoils, just showing where they occur across the region. You can see they occur in certain areas. And links to glossary information for technical terms, which is as visual as we can get it. Then people can also drill down some more detailed information, and that's accessible by the glossary we can click on a map unit and get information about that map unit. Link to soil profile information that we've got as well, and all that's glossary linked as well to the terms. And even um, showing some geomorphological models as well. So there's a lot of numerical models around, but these conceptual models are very important about the development of landscapes and some of the processes operating with them. And that comes out of people's heads. Uh, just in terms of the users, a lot of users of the soil information, just a few examples. The top one, the Bass Coast Land Care Coordinator, who uh, uses that information in her training for landholders and finds it useful for downloading information and for training purposes. Uh, also, the uh, lecturing, university, lecturing soil science at the University of Melbourne uh, is found in a useful reference site for many of the rare soil reports and contemporary soil data. Also notes that the students use the website extensively for their assignment research. Okay, so we developed, we've got partnerships with hundreds of people on, on this project. The Jim Wolf group that you heard about this morning is an example. So there's hundreds of years experience with these guys, and we're using it to develop maps, and textual information, and even the history of soil survey in Victoria. We're recording that, and that may not otherwise not get recorded. And also, for example, um, David talked about Ken doing his uh, PhD after retirement. We've actually got a, a visual version of that PhD here of maps. You can click onto some of the sites you visited and information about the sites, and that could be used for excursions. Uh, a whole lot of potential purposes for otherwise it may not get read as just as a PhD document sitting on the shelf. Okay, now we've just added this site, uh, this information this morning because uh, we didn't realise Chris wasn't going to talk about geographic visualisation. So in some ways this is a bit of an official launch of uh, the geographic visualisation portal on our website that's been developed in association with Chris Pettit's project funded by DPI. And it gives an overview of geographic visualisation and there's links in there to uh, video clips for example. And we'll just have a look at one of them at the end of the presentation. And that's an example there of the video opening on the screen. There's quite a lot of information on that portal, and you can have a look at the VRO booth downstairs if you want to actually see some of that material on the web. Just in terms of user evaluation, uh, we collect a lot of statistics on users. You can see this one's a basic one about the number of users per day. So, what we're doing, we're averaging about three, three and a half thousand pages viewed every day. And about five to seven hundred individual users a day are on the site. You can see the trends move up and down, and a lot of that's associated I think, with uh, students in and students on holiday. I think they're big users of the site. You can see it's been consistent with that. Also, what we've been doing, and Matthew Cox has been developing a process where we can look at IP uh, address profiling get an idea of who's using the site. So a lot of individual ISPs, a uh, big proportion of DPI, DSC, and CMA people as well. Not all the 
the Sandway thing, a lot of them are actually associated with the uh, OSP, so they may come out here to hard to separate them. Uh, universities, there's this block here, about 2% of usage, but there will be a lot of students using ISPs as well. And a whole lot of other users, you can see down here the, the different sort of users that have called out. You get them overseas, University of Florida, uh, British Columbia government, uh, Delhi University. So it's interesting just seeing potential users and getting an idea of how many pages they're accessing. So we'll be doing a bit more of that over time. Also, we've made use of other people's evaluations. So the OIRL project, which you may have talked about this this morning, it's one of the surveys that did about users and data and uh, knowledge. And Vero came out pretty high here. You can see in terms of data, uh, 55 or so percentage of the respondents used the website to get data. 80, 85% of the respondents use the website to get knowledge, which is one of the highest sources here. And when they looked at the response uh, to accessibility and ease of use, uh, Vero came out the highest with an average of 4.4 out of 5 in terms of uh, accessible information and ease of use, which is a pretty good rate. So just in terms of conclusions, um, I think the website represents a useful model for the effective dissemination of wide range of spatially based natural resource information. The project relies on developing effective partnerships with key information providers and users and maintaining and developing those. Uh, also relies on a continuous improvement approach to information client development, displaying spatial information at varying scales and varying levels of generalization, and also being able to bridge users' knowledge gaps and also to do user evaluation and understand users and how they're using this data and information. So I'll just actually go now and show this, which is the ge geographic visualization portal here. Uh, have a look at this other information on here. For example, there's a whole lot of reports you can access there. Some of the video clips here. So just run one as an example. This is actually using Google Earth and overlaying vector and image data on top and just showing the process. So it's right up a sec. So it's actually running itself through. You can see the handle showing Google Earth moving into an area in Victoria, which happens to be a bit better catchment. Some people will visit that at the uh, excursion on Friday. perspectives to look at that catchment. Access by clicking to this side. Yeah, so information from the Detroit Resource Online website. There's, there's a fair few examples to look at, and these are going to be developed. Uh, that project's developed the capabilities to do these, and these will be developed with various applications and various projects um, in DPI and DSC over time. And a lot of that will be made available on this website. So I'll just um, finish there. I'll assume we've got a bit of time for this.
moment we can manage it fairly well and it's just run by a small group of people. It seems to work pretty well, but I mean, we do need to look at other technologies and to improve efficiencies. Um, at the moment, we're constrained by having a project with a certain amount of people and certain resources. And we're coping pretty well with getting information on, but there is a huge backlog of previous information that we can still capture. So there is a balance, and maybe we, we could be looking at some of some other ways to do to actually enhance some of that. A lot of it's actually there's not a lot of data going on. It's more information, so it needs to be prepared with actual providers and work through with them through numerous iterations. And it's very much a people-to-people -people thing for a lot of it. And that's often the slowest thing is actually developing with people, improving it, and um, doing the iterations, and then getting it put on it tends to be some of the quickest part, really. It's actually the process of developing that relationship and developing these products, which takes a long time. Yeah. Sure. Um, we've been working along with the BCMC as well, and, and this is seen as a, a good means to access information. We've also got a soil health project within the department, and we've got a lot of soil health information on this site, and there's actually a, also a, a knowledge broker as part of that project, and this is the, the key means to get that information out. So very much we're trying to run them, run them together.